Authorities found the decapitated body hanging in the gang's woodshed. Cut it out and strung up by the heels. Hello, children. So the camera quality today is going to be a little... Not great. But again, welcome back to my channel. Today I want to talk about... I want to talk about a specific character. You may or may have not heard of him. He is well known somewhat in the Hall of Fame of Criminals. Not that they deserve a Hall of Fame. And that man is Ed Gein. And I want to talk about what role he's played in horror in the few years that have come. Because, believe it or not, a lot of characters have been actually based off of this man's real life story and I think it's only fair to talk about how reality has now inspired very iconic pieces of horror. So if you're into that, stay tuned. Edward Theodore Gein, better known as the 50s infamous murderer Ed Gein, the man who made furniture out of human skin, among other things. Contrary to popular belief, Ed Gein was not a serial killer, he's only ever killed two people. He got most of the skin that he used for his furniture and other body parts from the graves that he used to dug up back in the days, where he would get the source of the necessary items from these corpses to create his sick creations. And Gein inspired horror in more ways than one, which isn't surprising as horror loves to take from real life murderers and, you know, create fictions out of them like Eileen Wernos who inspired the movie Monster in 2003 played by Charlie Theron or Jeffrey Dahmer who inspired a more recent My Friend Dahmer in 2017 played by Ross Lynch or even the really more recent Netflix is extremely wicked shockingly vile and evil which was in 2019 which again starred Zac Efron as the infamous 70s serial killer and rapist Ted Bundy However, Gein inspired in different ways, mainly so the idea of skinning and making clothes slash furniture was a big part of what horror took from him, as well as his mental health, uh, him being a schizophrenic man. These traits give the horror general in general the idea of what became now some of the most iconic villains, that being Norman Bates which we mainly know from the movie Psycho, Psycho the sequel, Psycho the third, and again, based on the books by Robert Block, Psycho, Psycho 2, Psycho House, and Psycho Sanitarium, but this one was by Chet Williamson, I think that's how you say his name, as well as inspiring the series Bates Motel, Psycho 4 The Beginning, and on an episode of Raising Hope, you also get to see Norman Bates as a carrot. Number two on the list of characters he's inspired, Leatherface, those who big fans of Texas Chainsaw, you know who I'm talking about, he was in Texas Chainsaw Massacre, Texas Chainsaw Massacre 2, Leatherface, the Texas Chainsaw Massacre 3, Texas Chainsaw 3D, and finally the more recent Leatherface 2017. And finally, but not least, he also inspired Buffalo Bill, mainly seen in Silence of the Lambs, alongside the iconic cannibal Lecter, the cannibal who ate people but was now almost like a psychiatrist to a detective. Those who've seen the movie, they understand. He's inspired other characters as well, like he inspired Dr. Oliver Tretzen in an episode of American Horror Story, Asylum. The character Frank from the movie Three on a Meat Hook from 1972, the movie The Range from 1974, and in his dead mother, which is supposed to be a dark comedy, 1993. Child of God from 2014, among other myriad, really, of other films that he has. They've taken little bits and pieces of inspiration from, but those aren't really all that important. We're not going to talk about it today, or else the video will be like hour long. But these are the three mains that are really notable. You can tell clear, clear, clear inspiration from the actual real life events and the person itself. Our tale starts off in rural Wisconsin. The year is 1957. Hardware store owner Bernice Worden is missing and nobody in town is able to find her whereabouts. Bernice's son, deputy Frank Worden, finds bloodstains on the floor of her store and the cash register is open. 
The last person who had been spotted at the store was a local resident known as Ed Gein, who had been in the store to request a gallon of antifreeze. Keep in mind, Ed Gein was known by others of the town as the town's handyman, so this wasn't anything out of the ordinary for him. He was always a very secluded man who lived alone on his mother's farm, which was now his due to her passing. Nothing suspicious was really ever said of him other than he was a little stranger on women, but nothing that was really all that alarming to these people. They described him as a really kind, you know, friendly guy, but a little weird. But nothing that was too alarming back then. With this information, the Washara County Sheriff's Department sets out to investigate at his farm as he is now the last person on the crime scene. And so they're hoping to find clues that may lead to his arrest. Inside the shed, what they find will shock not only them, but the quiet town for decades later and will serve as one of the most gruesome tales to have come out of Wisconsin in the 50s. In the shed, police find a decapitated body hung upside down by her legs, with a crossbar at her ankles and ropes at her wrist. The torso was dressed out like a deer. She had been shot with a 22 caliber rifle, and the mutilations were made after her death. After searching through Ed's house, they also found whole human bones and fragments, a wastebasket made out of human skin, human skin covering several chair seats, skulls on bedposts, specifically female, some with the top sewn off, a corset made of female torso, skin from shoulder to waist, leggings made from human leg skin, masks made from the skin of female's heads, Bernice's warden entire head in a burlap sack, as well as her heart in a plastic bag in front of Gein's pot-bellied stove, nine in a shoebox, and a lot more grotesque pieces of human body parts that I don't want to get into because I don't want to get taken down on YouTube. But, um, needless to say, it's not, it was a very gruesome scene, and it's not something that uh, the average person would want to stumble upon. It was something that was so disturbing that even the cops back then were honestly shocked and disturbed, and they themselves weren't even expecting what they ended up finding in this man's house mainly going for middle-aged women who resembled his departed mother. For you see, Ed's mother was the only person who had been in his life. She was a very rigid and religious woman who instilled fear in her children from a very young age and secluded them from the world with her religious propaganda and fear and still tale. After her passing, he could not cope with the idea of being alone. And so he had already, as I mentioned prior, he was a schizophrenic man, so he had developed this idea of making a human suit that he could literally crawl into to become her. Hence why he went for middle-aged women who resembled his mother. He wanted to become his own mother. He was later, again, institutionalized at the Central State Hospital for the Criminally Insane. No longer has that name currently anymore, and he claimed to have been a model citizen there in the sense that he then got along very well with most of the people in the actual institution even though he did such a gruesome act. And he was finally trialed after that and passed away in 1984 due to respiratory failure. Norman Bates The character of Norman Bates comes to borrow from Ed his mental state his obsession with his mother and his strange relationship with death and killings. Norman Bates is portrayed as an adult in the Psycho movies, but thanks to Bates Motel, you get to see him on the younger side as a character and his descent into madness. In Psycho, his mother has already passed away and already he has issues with killing women. He lives alone in his mother's motel, similar to how Ed inhabited his mother's farm after her passing. 
He lures people into the motel where he proceeds to spy on them through a hole in his wall before he kills them. Notably known for the shower scene. He had the taxidermied body of his mother in his basement where he would talk to her as if she was a living and breathing person. In Bates Motel, Norman is still a growing boy who suffers from trying to fit into a new school as his mother tries to build a successful motel. It doesn't go too well as Norman is seen slowly developing what seems to be a case of dissociative identity disorder, also known as multiple personality disorder back in the days, as he starts to commit violent acts that he no longer remembers as he seems to pass out or black out when said incidents happen. He grows more and more violent throughout the series as he tries to understand what is happening to him and his mother who is incredibly overprotective and harsh to most and tries to hide the fact that her son is struggling with his mental state but also getting more and more dangerous. Just like Ed, he gets the restrictive life as his mother is way too attached to him and he has a very strange relationship with her and that tends to lead more towards obsession than love really. His mother unable to keep relationships going for herself as well only makes their relationship much stranger and borderline a little creepy. Leatherface. Now, Leatherface isn't all that well known as a character in the movies or even some of the books. He is a more quiet and reserved character, so we don't really get to see much of him, but you can clearly see the inspiration still for Leatherface through Edgy. Um, so I'll, I'll go over those as well as I can, because again, he not much is, is known about him. That is at least confirmed in canon. So Texas Chainsaw's own little cutout of Ed Gein is portrayed through a more silent persona. Not much is known of him at first, other than the skin mask that he wears, and the fact that he isn't the brightest. Again, just like Ed, he's being controlled heavily by his family, and their disposition to eat humans' meat and torture human beings. So he serves as their puppet and as their butcher, being a pretty tall and bulky individual, in the movies you can tell he's a very, very tall man and uh, makes it quite easy for him to grab people because of his bulky stature. His family being pretty sadistic like to make furniture from the bones and skin of the victims, similar to Gein. Leatherface is known to hang people on meat hooks on the family's farm's basement before coming back to finish them off. Not much is known of him as a character as he serves only really as a side character in the movies, but in Leatherface 2017, we get a little bit more backstory to him, but it's not quite canon, I'm pretty sure, so it's debatable whether or not it's a real backstory, so I won't really touch on that today. But from what we get of Leatherface, we see, again, the mask that he wears being similar to Ed's collections of human skin masks. He also is being manipulated by his family, similar to his growing life situation on top of the fact that they make his family makes furniture out of human remains which is also very similar to what Ed King did so you can see the very clear inspiration in this character and overall the family in the movie uh, and you can tell that they took Ed's book the real life killer himself now this one's a little bit more interesting and almost a little closer, yet also very far from the original, but the last character that I wanted to touch on was Buffalo Bill, which is, of course, the man from Silence of the Lambs. He's also known as Jane Gum, and not James, because they misspelled his name in the birth certificate, so they never corrected it, so technically his name is Jane, but he's supposed to have an S. And he's the main killer of the Silence of the Lamb movies. Now, he appears as a troubled individual who wants to make skin suits of women, specifically, so he can become one himself. But not in the same context that Ed Gein had. More so, he is in, he expresses in the movie and the books because there are sounds of the Lamb's book. Or at least, <laughs> it's not called Silence of the Lambs, but the movie was inspired off of the books. It said that he was made into a criminal in the movie by this quote that I found a little bit interesting being delivered by Dr. Lecter that goes I bet he wasn't born a criminal, Clarice. 
He was made one through years of systematic abuse. Now, his character is known to have had traumatic, a traumatic life and struggles with his own gender identity. In the movie and the novel that inspired it, Bill is clearly showing signs of gender dysphoria as he wants to be more than anything a woman. And, well, he thinks that by skinning people and making a female suit, it's the closest he'll be to being a woman. However, many characters in the book and the movie claim that Bill is not in fact transgender. Now before you crucify me, this isn't my words, this is literally what the movie and the book say. So don't kill me. <laughs> but in the novel especially, there were examples given as to why he does not fit the psychological profile of a trans woman. Billy is not a real transsexual, but he thinks he is. He tries to be. He's tried to be a lot of things, I expect. And you said that I was very close to the way we would catch him. What did you mean, Doctor? There are three major centers for transsexual surgery. Johns Hopkins, the University of Minnesota, and Columbus Medical Center. I wouldn't be surprised if Billy had applied for sex reassignment at one or all of them and been rejected. On what basis would they reject him? Look for severe childhood disturbances associated with violence. Billy hates his own identity, you see, and he thinks that makes him a transsexual. But his pathology is a thousand times more savage and more terrifying. Bill being, well, too mentally unstable to get proper gender reassignment surgery, can only think of making a female skin suit as a happy medium to achieving his full transformation. Now, to touch on the similarities between Bill and Ed, of course, Ed wasn't suffering from gender, but he stated in a couple of talks and interviews with the people in the psychiatry ward that he did grow up with some trauma in the house or mainly inflicted by his mother. Similarly to Bill, Another more clear aspect is the skinning of women to make the skin suit to become one. Granted, for Ed, it was to suit his own hurt and the loss of his mother, which he, again, wasn't experiencing gender disorder, but he was schizophrenic and he started hearing and, and believed that he could, that he was her and that he could almost revive her through what he did. Whereas, for Bill, it was literally to express his gender identity. Again, they both ended with the same result. So in my eyes, Bill is actually the character that almost imitates Ed at the closest. Mainly because of that. Because in fact, in the movie, I will insert little clips that are as censored as can be. Because the movie is quite, um, quite out there. But, as you can see, he very clearly is the character that has the most inspiration taken from him. So, in that sense, I say he's almost the character that imitates him at the closest level, even though the motive behind it is completely different. But it ends with the same result. Now, all three characters come to imitate the real life characters in very different aspects and all have very specific traits of what Ed's personality was like, or assumed to be like, you know? While they make it their own in their own ways. It paints a much broader picture that I kind of want to touch on a little bit. And this is something that touches on the real life event as much as it touches the fictional characters. And that specific topic is mental illness. And especially because it's on the rise and it's a massive problem for a lot of people. I myself have issues with certain things. So Ed, while being a criminal, was also mentally unstable. And of course, he could have potentially been prevented from committing what he committed if he did get the help that he needed. That. I think this is a very important point I want to touch on. Um, in a way, I think Norman Bates, the character, actually painted it very well because Norman, throughout, especially the series, is painted as a man who struggles immensely with his mental health. To where it literally hinders him to a point that he can't even begin to comprehend and understand because he doesn't have the resources around him to do so. So I think it's important to touch on these things, even though they're a tricky subject and they can be a little taboo. 
I think it's immensely important because a lot of the people that are institutionalized and commit crimes have a form of mental disorder. So please, if you suffer from any kind of issues, always seek help. I know it's hard to do, and I know that not everybody wants to, um, but I think it's important because of things like this, especially if it's something that you can't cope with yourself, and if you know that the results may not always be. Now I'm not saying that people with mental disorders are going to alter and see what that's not what I'm trying to say, but um, it's important to regardless, because again, a lot of people struggle with their mental health, and not all of them will, again, become a serial killer. This isn't a Shane Dawson documentary, I'm not sitting here talking about if you have antisocial personality disorder, you're gonna turn into a fucking psychopathic killer. <laughs> but, my point was, if you have issues with any of these things, seek out. Talk to someone, it doesn't have to be like a therapist, just talk to someone, in general, someone you can trust. Because, a lot of these things I feel could be prevented. At least with the proper care, but since people want to ignore and act like these things aren't big issues, well, you find yourself in a position where less than ideal, to say the least. So that was my little side note on that, uh, because again, it's a topic I find really important to talk about, and honestly, it's a big deal. As much as people don't want to acknowledge it, it is a massive, massive deal. And so, that was my video. <laughs> that was my video for today. I hope you guys enjoyed it. I hope you understand what I was trying to do with this. And again, like I said, horror, me being somebody who consumes so much horror, horror has always been something that so heavily almost depends on these people. And as fucking shitty as these people are, it's hard to acknowledge the fact that they do inspire a lot of these fucking genres. Um, because life likes to imitate Art likes to imitate from life, but yeah, if you guys enjoyed the video, I hope to see you in the next one. So make sure you click the subscribe, click like, and uh, make sure you leave me a comment. If you know someone that struggles with mental health, or you yourself struggle with mental health, uh, leave me a comment if you want on that, um, as somebody who also has their own struggles. Hopefully, you know, I... I'm a small little, <laughs> I'm a small little channel. I don't have many subscribers or, or views right now, so I can pretty much check all the comments. I'll, I'll try and answer anything if anybody wants to leave any kind. But yeah, until then, I'll see you guys in the next video.